Okay, ohayo gozaimasu. Fasten your seat belt, put your trays in the upright position. I'm going to take you for a ride. I'm going to take you for a ride in the global economy. I know what you're saying, I'm not a pilot, I'm an economist, and you know what the old President Truman said about economists? Ah, economists talking about economics. That's like peeing in your pants. Feels hot to you, leaves everybody else cold. But whether you like it or not, we're all subject and hostage to economic forces. And they figured I could give you a bit of an insight into what's ahead in the global economy, because I've been stuck in Japan for the last 20 years. <laughs> Asset deflation, bankrupt banks, incompetent politicians. We know how to deal with this. So let's see where the similarities and where the differences are between the Japanese collapse of the bubble economy and the lost decade and what lies ahead for the global economy here. Sorry, we're going to have to do some numbers. I'm told this is a very busy slide. But this is what the force of the bubble economy has been in Japan and was in the United States. This is the money multiplier. What this means, how many financial assets do I need to mobilize to make one unit of national income? So you see, in America, between 85 and 95, you needed $3 of finance to make $1 of national income. Then we had a lot of deregulation, liberalization, and you see that 96 to 2006, you actually needed $6 of finance to make $1 of national income. So that was great for people like myself because I work in banking. We obviously saw a lot of increases there, but actually the transmission from finance into the real economy that we all live in actually worsened. You needed to use $3 for $1 of GDP, then you needed $6. Now at the peak of the American bubble economy, you actually needed almost $8 to make one unit of GDP. Okay, so that's quite interesting, quite important. Contrast that to what goes on, what went on in Japan. Before the bubble, you needed 1.7 yen of finance to make one yen of national income. During the bubble, that went to three yen, and at the peak, it was almost five yen. So the fundamental economic forces were the same, but let's have a look at some of the differences here. What do you see? Basically, three differences. The first one, yes. America, it's bigger, it's better. You see that in Japan it was only three, in America it was six, so there was a lot more activity that was going on. But you see something else that's very different and quite important for the outlook from here on, namely that Japan's bubble was predominantly by bank loans. It was just standard bank lending that increased dramatically. You had a piece of land, the banker would look at that piece of land and said, ooh, that's, a lot, uh, that's worth a lot more. You would get a loan against it and off you went. In the United States, you see that bank lending, bank loans were not really the big growth driver, but it was other credit which is to say the shadow banking system, derivatives, securities, subprime mortgages, all this funky stuff that financial advisors came up with and advised. So Japan was a very simple bubble economy, real estate, bank loans, that was it. America, very complicated, shadow banking, a lot of structured finance that went on. So Japan was a Zen bubble, America was a complicated Hollywood bubble that is much, much more complicated to actually sort out. The second difference, which, the third difference, which is very important, Japan's bubble. Who did it? Who owned the assets? It was all Japanese. There was very little international finance. In the 1980s, there really was very little American banking activity or European banking activity. It was Japanese bankers lending to Japanese people. When the bubble collapsed, who suffered? It was just the Japanese. In the United States, very different. About 75% 
of all the assets that were structured and created by the shadow banking system, about 70% ended up being owned by the rest of the world. It was Chinese sovereign wealth funds, Japanese insurance companies, Brazilian mutual fund. It was spread all over. So again, the Japanese bubble was a domestic Zen bubble. The American bubble was a global Hollywood bubble. But that actually means something very important, because again, when the bubble collapses, who gets hurt? In Japan, it was only the Japanese. The Japanese were bankrupt, they suffered from negative wealth, the unemployment rate went up dramatically. In the United States, when the bubble collapsed, who suffers? Everybody, the entire world. It was spread out, it was diversified. And that ironically actually turns out to be quite a good thing. Yes, everybody has suffered together, but it means that actually the forces of recovery are much, much more stable uh, than what we had here in Japan. So from that perspective, you know, I think that Japan in the 1980s and the bubble collapse and what we've seen recently in the United States and the global economy really cannot be compared that much. There are, however, some great similarities in terms of what lies ahead, what we can do in terms of forecast. And you know that in the United States, we basically have seen a doubling of the unemployment rate from about 5% to 10%. Now, some simple economics. To grow, you need people. When you grow, you need more people. That's the way it works. Now, if you build a simple model, you actually find that for America, to go back to a 6% unemployment rate, America would have to grow by six percentage points for 2010, 2011, 2012. So the American economy every year from now on would have to grow by 6% in order to get unemployment down to six percentage points. Is that possible? Everything is possible. It's America. Come on. <laughs> is that likely? Probably not. So the result of that is that we get the new economic reality is fairly easy to forecast. You have structurally high unemployment, just as we had structurally high unemployment here in Japan. The problem is, what does that do to American society? What are the social implications? That's really, I think, the big question mark that we, as economists, cannot really answer. Of course, there is a big underlying force going on in the global economy right now that we should not forget about. And that is that, and I'm sorry to be like a textbook guy now, but this is a gigantic supply side revolution that is going on in the world. Everywhere, whether it's Germany, India, Brazil, Papua New Guinea, you find that there is new entrepreneurs wanting to offer more goods and services using innovation, using their creativity, using whatever endeavor they have as human beings, using all this technology, more goods and services for lower prices. So think the unthinkable, break the rules, be scared. That has not changed whatsoever. And just to put one thing in perspective here, we are in uncharted territory. We have a global world, and this is fantastic. But look at the economics of it. There were transitions of empire in the past. 1881, you had America surpass England in terms of productive capacity. In 1881, it was America that became the factory of the world. But at that time, the wage gap was 1.2. The next transition was in 1979. It was actually Japan that became the factory of the world. The wage gap at the time was 1.4, and it was just six, uh, sorry, eight years ago that China became the factory of the world. You can see 1.2, 1.4, but the wage gap here is 30 times. So fasten your seatbelt. Let's have happy competition. Use the technology, use your design, use your creativity. There's enormous amount of opportunity out there. The world is not ending. It will be wobbly. Fasten your seatbelt, but don't forget, there will be an exit, and we can all have a good time. Thank you very much.